Hi, welcome to the Berry Nation podcast, where we support the bariatric community with humor, humility, and honesty. I'm April. I'm Jason. I'm Natalie. Today, we're welcoming for the very first time of the podcast, which I cannot believe, our friend and Berry Nation expert, Miss Tamisha Malone. Hi, Hi Tamisha. Thank you for letting me join. We're so excited. I really could not believe that this is the first time that we've had you on the podcast. We've been busy. Going. I feel like we talk all the time. We're always talking via Zoom. We're talking about something that's happening in our bariatric community. We're talking about something in the membership community. We're just talking because we're friends. Like, so I feel like we're always doing this, but we've never done it officially in the podcast like format. So welcome, my friend. Thank you. I'm excited uh, to be here and just I chat. I know. I mean, this is pretty much what we do all the time, but now it's recorded, which makes it even now it's recorded. It means it's legit. We're like legit friends. Now. Yeah. <laughs> Official. It's Official. Okay. That's my gavel. <laughs> so our conversation today, we really want to focus on movement. We, we, we know that you're a bariatric patient. We know that you have a lot going on professionally, right? In your business and variation in the community, all, all of the things. But you have recently, in the past year, discovered a passion for movement. And this month, if, if you are listening in no October of 2022, <laughs> I'm trying to remember what uh, like what year is it? <laughs> what year is it? What planet am I on? <laughs> if you're if you're listening, watching now, our focus this month is movement, right? How do we make movement not so scary? Uh, so that's really what we're hoping to, to get out of this conversation today. Mm -hmm. So before we jump into that, I'd love to just kind of give you the floor. Will you introduce yourself to our friends and listeners that maybe don't know you? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Tamisha. I am a licensed bariatric therapist, but I am also a bariatric patient. Uh, I love it when the two worlds come together because there's a level of empathy and support and understanding that comes with being a patient, as well as having the tools to be a provider. Um, and so I have, um, you know, created my business around um, from one bariatric bariatric patient to another I understand and I take that to heart um, because it takes a community it takes very nation to really support our community um, yes. so hats off to all of you my friends well and your business is so integral right you you provide the psychiatric evaluations that people need for approvals right Yes, I also provide individualized therapy. Just oh my gosh. So you are like the one go-to person that people need when they when they really want to onboard that therapeutic support. I am. And it's nice because there are, you know, it, people will spiral after bariatrics because it's so unknown, right? It's like bringing home this brand new baby and here you go, make sure they stay alive. And you're like, what do I do with this, right? So that's bariatrics. Here you go. Here's your brand new bariatric tummy. Good luck. Keep it alive. Right? Like this. It's not a baby. It's like you. And so you're like, what the heck am I supposed to do with myself? Well, have you checked your binder? Oh. I didn't get I checked, it. I checked my binder for a lot of shit that wasn't there. I, I checked it a lot. They said the same few pages that still didn't give me any of the information I needed. So, yeah. So, so what do we do in that time? What do we do? We ask our community. We ask the people around us. Hey, what is going on? Why am I getting this pain in my chest? Right? Mm -hmm. What did I eat? What's not settling well? You ask your friends around you. Hey, I'm dumping in the middle of Applebee's. Somebody come help me. Right? Like you call your best bariatric bud. And you find that in support in people who can have that empathy and understanding. So it comes with our community. And so many patients that, that we have got to, to know and become friends with, really after surgery, it's like you have this newfound capacity to do the thing that was kind of always brewing inside you, but mm -hmm. the weight was really kind of keeping it down. And so many people after surgery, right? We always hear them say, oh my gosh, I have so much energy and I want to do all the things and I want to help and I want to give back because surgery literally allows that gratitude to grow within you. And now you have the energy to do something with it, which is I think why we see so many bariatric patients, 
you know, create or do things within the community or create and do things on a grander scale in what they're already doing professionally, or just take a true leap of faith and, and do something completely different because mm -hmm. it's just such a new world after surgery. And that needs there, there's something broken in the wheel, right? There's something that we're missing as providers and as, you know, that setting in what's next and that what's next is community, right? I always, I keep saying that, but that is the missing link. Yes. It's someone who can empathize and understand. So yes, just full circle, my friend, you did it full circle. Full circle. <laughs> Well, the uh, Whitney and Rindy and uh, uh, Carrie did an Instagram live just a couple of days ago, and they said something that has literally blown my mind and just changed the way that I have thought about what support has to look like after surgery. In the live, Whitney really specifically called out weight loss medications, these new GLP-1 blockers, and she kept calling it adjunct therapy. Yeah. And I was like, adjunct therapy? And I was like, Oh my God, right? Our primary treatment for a chronic disease of obesity has been bariatric surgery. Mm -hmm. Cool. But like every other treatment for a disease, anything, right? A new knee, a new hip, a heart, right? Heart valve, like you name it. You have a primary form of treatment and then you have these adjunct treatments. Mm -hmm. And in bariatric surgery, there is none. There are no adjunct treatments, it, a binder. Right. Or, or a support group that's maybe offered once a month or a Facebook group. Mm -hmm. That's the adjunct treatment. And it is not adequate in any sense of the word. And that's what most people, that's the only thing that most people have. Mm -hmm. Right. So after she said that, it was like, oh my God, this is what we are doing is that we have patients have realized we need adjunct therapies. Yep. Right. We need something else to support our main treatment. And what we have found is that it's that community element that was so missing. And when you when you add the experts and the education and the support and the classes and the meetup, right, when, when you have that that educational piece with that social piece, when that comes together, it is just incredible. And we always hear people, right, in our greater bariatric community, in the Barry Nation membership, they just talk about like, oh my God, I finally feel like I'm getting it, or I finally feel like, oh my God, this is what I needed. I just needed someone to talk to, or I just needed to hear that, or oh my God, I read that in the perfect moment. That is adjunct therapy. And when I really started thinking about all of the things that we could do, you know, for these other, you know, therapies that we can onboard for our primary treatment, it just like, Oh my God, blew my mind, blew yeah. my mind. So the standard level, right? What everybody is talking about is validation, right? Once we start validating and meeting them where they are at is when we start feeling acceptance. It's when we start realizing that these adjunct therapies are needed. We're not a bad bariatric patient because they don't exist. Mm -hmm. it's that validation that you are doing everything that you can and it's not a one size fits all. Absolutely. That is key. Absolutely. And that's what I, you said that, and it just reminded me, you know, I, I had surgery when I was very young, um, did not have validation. I mean, this was 2009 when I had my lap band done. There's, I mean, it was an unknown really. I mean, all people knew were, was the bypass. Um, and I, you know, think back, I'm not like beating myself up, but I think back about like, why didn't that work for me? Well, part of it was that my medical device, my surgery failed me, but also I didn't have the adjunct therapy, the community to say, Hey, this isn't normal. What you're feeling is normal, but what's happening to you is not normal. I didn't have that. And now I do. Right. But we still have to create it for ourselves. It's not like a, I, it, we were talking about this before recording, but it's not something that is widely accepted. It's, it's still stigmatized. Well, and it's hard too, because you have the, like, you know, you have the option to go to the community now, which is amazing because before, like, what are you going to go to WebMD and everything is going to lead back to your dying. You've got some kind of mass tumor You've got some kind of rare form of botulism that's going to fucking take you out. Like there's always something out there that, you know, you're going to WebMD yourself to death 
and it's not that serious. Like it's not that deep. It doesn't have to go that far. Like you can go up to somebody and be like, oh yeah, I had that too. It's going to pass. Just do this. Don't eat that. You know, try not to do this. And, and, and it comes back around. But, you know, that's where the community comes into play as being so integral and a part of this process that so many people just don't. It's so undersold. It's as, it's almost as undersold as the mental health aspect of pre yeah. Like they don't want to tell you that because they don't want to scare you off. Well, they damn sure don't want to tell you about the community being so large. And, and you know, we're we're experts in our patient experience. So but they don't want that because they can't make money off it. So nobody's going to sing the praises of the community at large because we don't know because we're not we don't have you know white coats and we don't have degrees on them. Well, some of us. Yeah. And I think the other the other missing piece of this is they just don't know that it exists. They don't know yeah. that so many patients are 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 out right with their experience. They don't know that that we are ready to help others and that we're ready to kind of live in the light. They don't understand that we're not ashamed. Of our of our surgery and our medical decision, and that we're here to help others. Like they just they don't quite acknowledge that we actually do have a missing piece to mm -hmm. bariatric medicine, and that is the patient story and the community experience. We have that, and it's needed, and it's necessary, and it's vibrant, and it's bright, it's safe, and it's growing. Mm -hmm. Which is why this podcast and and all the other podcasts out there and all the other resources, right, in our community and other communities. That's why they're they are critically important because it, it gets you kind of through the, the those kind of three stages. Like I literally I wrote it down, I wrote it down on my planner. Validation leads to acceptance, and acceptance leads to positive changes. Mm -hmm. Right? Validation, acceptance, positive change. And those with those three things. Well, my friends, blow your mind. So that, exactly what you wrote down, is a cognitive behavioral therapy. It's called the cognitive triangle. Thoughts affect our actions, which affect our feelings. Thoughts affect our actions, which affect our feelings, and vice versa. So if we feel that stigma, if we feel like we don't have that validation, that's going to lead to a thought. That thought is in less than a something is wrong. I'm I'm a bad bariatric patient, right? These quotes, knowledge the quotes, lead to actions. Well, it's all for nothing. Those cognitive distortions come in, fuck it. Am I allowed to say fuck it? Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, so that's that that thought behavior action. So oh my flipping. God, I mean, so basically I should, I should expect another degree in the mail from some university because we're all <laughs> geniuses here. I mean, welcome to your MSW. <laughs> okay. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. But that so beautifully describes it. And that triangle is a, yeah, right. Because it's not a triangle if you, unless you got all three of that, mm -hmm. right. All three of those sides come together to make that kind of that real rigid structure. And if it's negative, it's going to just bounce around negative but if you throw something positive in there it's going to grow and become positive all the time and it can change at any point right it doesn't have to change with the top you know thought feeling right so you have that thought something's wrong something must be wrong with me right then that feeling but if a community member is there to validate that feeling and acknowledge that these things happen you're doing everything good right? Then that's going to affect what the action is. Oh my God. It, that's what cracks the door open. It's that one interaction that can crack the door to changing this mindset of ours. <laughs> Validation is key. So thank you for coming to our bariatric <laughs> TED talk. We're going to have to come <laughs> We're done. It's good. We, can... we broke. We broke April. She's yeah. We have to wait to come back when she's fixed. And... Oh my god! But really, but we can apply this. Truly, I mean, now, like, okay, now I'm like, wait a minute. This can be applied to like any of these situations. So, like, what we want to talk to you today about movement. It's yeah. the same thing, right? You you have a validating experience when it comes to movement or a movement thought or a movement action, and it can and you can build on those other missing. Um, Oh, yeah. Okay, I guess it was right. So what is movement, right? So I think that's the first conversation. Yes. Movement, honestly, yes. 
how we express ourselves in the great scheme of things, right? It's, you know, getting up and walking outside. It is physically moving your arms. If you're Italian, talking with them, you know, it's literally language. Movement is language. Movement is just how we express ourselves on the normal behavior. But those cognitive distortions want us to believe that movement is more than just that. Movement is going to the gym, busting your ass every day, weightlifting. Movement is simpler than that. And so when we break down movement, it becomes less scary. It becomes more tolerable, it becomes something that we're doing every day. Breathing is movement, right? And you're going to think I'm crazy, but taking a deep breath, you are using those muscles, right? Mm -hmm. Breathing is movement. And when we justify and simplify movement, it becomes less scary. Well, I think Jason, you and I talked about this awesome or uh, often, because one of my aha conversations with with you and I think it was with somebody else I realized this Tamisha I realized like I was talking myself out of movement because I thought it had to be so prescribed I thought movement had to be this regimented program or this like you know kickboxing thing or I had to do it exactly perfectly at this time follow this person do this do this right and it was just like one day somebody gave me that little statement it was like movement is anything intentional that you love to do and that you're consistent with like movement Mm -hmm. is something above and beyond what you do with your normal day but it doesn't have to be this very rigid thing it was i absolutely had a distortion when it came to to movement well and a lot of people do it's not just you like i I know a, a long time ago i started with just parking my car farther away from wherever it was i was going if I'm at the grocery store, I picked the farthest spot, I parked there, and I walked my ass to the store. Then I walked back to the car. That's movement until I'm ready to do something different. And movement for me is going to look different than movement for Tamisha, Natalie, and it. Like it just, it's not the same for everybody. Mm-hmm. And the one thing that I keep, you know, coming back to is, is that just because you don't like something now doesn't mean you're not going to like it later when you lose more weight and can move around better. And there may be stuff that you tried a long time ago it, somewhere along your pre-op journey that you didn't like then. Mm-hmm. It never hurts to go back and try again. If you still hate it, cool, do something else. You may find that you like some of the stuff that you didn't used to like before, and that's okay too. It's just about doing it like, like when it really comes down to movement, it is whatever you can do that you will continue to do. Like, mm-hmm. I don't care what it is. As long as you're going to continue to do it, that's what matters. Absolutely. And that's something that I was struggling with for a while, like recently, because I was like, I have to find something different. I mean, that was like one of my fall goals. If you listen to that podcast episode at the beginning of fall, like I was like, I need to find something different. And I was so hell bent on finding something different that I wasn't doing my walking every day. I was like, no, it's not enough. It has to be something else. Like, like my brain you were busy shopping busy shopping for new movements so you just left the old movie yeah exactly I was like "Eh, this one doesn't work anymore chuck it like it was really weird and then over the weekend I was like oh it's a beautiful day I have these errands to run that are all within literally within a couple miles of me And I just thought, oh, you know, it's so nice out. Like, I'm just going to walk to the post office, which is about like a little over a mile and a half. And as I was walking back, I was like, why am I such in such a good mood? And then I was, I just walked a mile and a half. Like, what the heck? It's because I was walking and I love to walk and I hadn't been doing it for probably six weeks because I just didn't, I thought it wasn't enough. I would take Hooper like around the block because he's spoiled and won't do his business unless he's walking and so I was like oh yeah I'll just take him around the block but like I actually missed walking well and the thing about it is, is like it's not that like I get that you may think it, it's not enough and if you're at that point in your journey you don't always have to abandon what you've been doing to try something new you can always habit stack and do something else 
add that on to whatever it is you want to try as well. But if what you're doing, you know, like you said, brings you that amount of joy, like keep doing it. And do you know why it brings you so much joy? This is, this is going to be my geek coming out, right? Because I love oh. the science behind it. It's your, your brain-driven neuropathic factors. So it's your neurons. It's just a fancy way of saying neurons that fire together stay together. When you have a positive neuron that's associated with your physical health and movement, neurons that fire together stay together. And movement actually gives you that dopamine high. It gives you that cerebellum that's working the both sides of your brain, right? So that's why you're able to release more when you work out. You're able to just have that good feeling and let that shit go. You know, when they say go for a walk, cool down, go for a walk, it's because it's stimulating both sides of your brain to help those neurons fire together and help you process situations. Wow. Okay. I'm done. I'm deceased. <laughs> you know, like Elle Woods, you know, I know that's funny, but in Legally Blonde, she's like, people that work out are happier. And there's it's a good. science behind that because of the neurons. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I was actually doing a very difficult thing. Like I was returning a dress that was like too small for me. I was like, I don't want to do this, but I was like, it's a beautiful day. The post office is open. Like, I'm just going to go do this. And by the time I got to the post office, I was like, oh, hello. Good morning. Like I was in the worst mood that day, like that morning. Um, but yeah. And then I realized like, oh no, you love doing this. So why would I, st why would I just halt that? You know? But we're so quick to have that mindset that is, you know, things get busy. What's something that we can take off from our agenda? Absolutely. And although I have my certified personal training, although I, although I know it's good for me, there have been weeks that I haven't been to the gym, right? Because we're only human. Yeah. Right? Well, but and that's just like, right? That it's our old brain. It, it's our old life. It's just, it, it, what was once comfortable is still comfortable. It's going to take a very long time for, right, this new way of thinking, this new life, this newfound love of movement to transition to, oh, no, this is actually more comfortable now than what was before, right? Mm -hmm. So when we feel this pull back to the old, there's nothing wrong with us. It's what our brains are wired to do. But remembering the joy that you have and the things that you do are what matter. And that's what brings you out of that rabbit hole. And allowing that space and grace that I hear often. Hmm. I wonder if you heard that. I actually I have a, that's my sticker. I have a, uh, no. I think, I think we all do. It's, I mean, we all know it's like our absolute favorite saying. I, I think I say it to myself every day. And yeah. it's, and it's not, it's not a phrase to give us permission to not do something. Mm -hmm. Really what it is, is it's a phrase to, for me, it's a phrase to kick my butt into doing something aligned to what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. right? So like the other day I was like, I'm gonna get up extra early and I'm gonna treadmill. I got up extra early, I got way carried away with work and I didn't treadmill, but movement was something I wanted to do. And I was like, you know what, I'm still, okay, I, I need the space away from my rigidity when it comes to what movement is going to do. And I need the grace to know that some days it's just going to look a little different. So I'm going to get my butt up and I'm going to go walk my street for 15 minutes. And that was what I did, right? So it's not a, a phrase. It's not a, a motto or mantra to allow us permission to not do what we set out to do. It allows us to do something aligned to what we wanted to do. Even if we can't accomplish 100%, I can do something towards that. That's what that's about. Helps break those cognitive distortions of I should, I oughta, those guilty feelings. Yes. Right? Because they're not a helpful way of thinking. No. And I think before we go any further, we should probably take a hot minute and define what is a cognitive distortion? Mm. Well, you want to take it away or you want me? No, I hell no. I don't know what it is. We're going to let the pro. You know? MSW 10 minutes ago. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> 
It's still in the mail. It's still yeah. in the mail. Mm -hmm. Cognitive distortions are an unhealthy way of thinking. It's something that interferes with our way of thinking that we may not even know that we are consciously doing it. A few examples of these are all or nothing thinking, which is black or white. If I don't get all of my protein in, then today went to shit, right? Something that we, we all tend to do. Am I allowed to say shit? Yes, bro. Oh you can we, say we put it shit, damn, whatever your heart desires. Yes. My name is Tanisha. I identify as a hot mess social worker. <laughs> With that, uh, thank you. We have something called mental filtering, where we filter only certain types of evidence, right? One of these could be positive evidence. Everything is all rainbows and unicorns, and we forget the lump under the rug that we swept under there. Or, you know, it could be the opposite side. Everything sucks. Think of Eeyore, right? And not acknowledging the good, which can put us in a funk. The other major one is, is that shoulds, oughtas, guilty feelings. When we say, oh, I should go for a walk. Oh, I have to complete my full 15 minutes. Or I didn't do it all. And so that puts guilt into us instead of acknowledging, hey, you got your butt out there and that's awesome. Even if it's, I drove myself to the park, I drove myself to the gym, I made the effort. If I'm nervous, look at the steps that I've done to set myself up for success. And that's what's needed. And that's where space and grace comes in setting yourself up for success and knowing that you're doing the steps to better yourself. Yeah. And I think with movement, we really trip ourselves up because for so long, I know many of us uh, used movement or exercise as a punishment for mm -hmm. choices that we made in the kitchen, right? I mm -hmm. ate this, I consumed this, I drank this, I fell off the wagon, I didn't follow my diet perfectly. I'm a horrible human. I need to go work it off at the gym right? It became a punishment. It became a place of punishment. And what we've really come to understand is that movement is a celebration of what our bodies can do or what our bodies will soon be able to do, right? Because I know that there's a lot of people in our community that struggle with that limited mobility, right? Before and after surgery. And sometimes we like wake up from surgery and we think like, oh, I'm going to be super fit now just instantaneously. And that starts, right, th that's a distortion that, that we have as well. And I know, Jason, this is something that you've done a lot of work around, right? Just really making that mindset shift away from movement as punishment to movement as a celebration. Yeah, and, and also realizing that I'm not just going to wake up after surgery and become a gym rat because that's what I used to, you know, but like I, I always wanted to just be in there and just get rocked up and do all the things. But when you really think about it, it's like that's not, you know, if it's something you've never done, you're not just going to wake up one day and go, oh, man, this is what I'm going to have to do. And I'm going to put four hours in the gym every day and it's going to be great. And I'm going to love it. and It's going to be fantastic. When in reality, I was going to the gym, loving life and had my break that was given to me by my doctor. And as soon as the break was over, I was like, shit, yeah, I can get back to it. I haven't been in two months. Mm -hmm. I went, I went a couple of days and was like, yeah, I love it. And then I was just like, yeah, but I also love not doing it. So mm -hmm. when you really come to think about it, I'm like, when I think of not only some of the choices in the kitchen I'm making, the fact that I'm not going to work out because it's like, oh, well, Sarah, and then we're doing the step bet. So I walk with them. So ah, it's fine. That's another, that's, that's movement, which it is. But my body requires more than that. And I know that, but I'm not doing that. And yet I'm still sitting over here, woe is me about my regain when I know I'm not putting the work in, I need to, to be able to get it all off. So at the end of the day, when you put the two and two together, you, you kind of like, you know, like Tamisha was saying, you kind of filter that shit out of there and go, Oh, just regain it sucks. And it happens to everybody. It's like, but I know the formula for it not to happen to me yet. I'm just, you know, I'm filtering that shit out and going, Oh man, it just sucks. And I'm sitting there with this regain. <laughs> if only I could fix it. Well, so Tamisha, what would you suggest to Jason? Like what, what are some tools or strategies that Jason can use to get to a different place with movement? Sure. It's rebuilding your connection with movement, 
right? It's reframing that mindset and that relationship. We had to spend so much time reframing our relationship with food, right? And now we're at a place where we can be okay. And so that's the same with movement, right? It's not, you have to go to the gym so many times a day to feel successful. It's how can I move my body today in a way that's going to benefit me, that I'm not going to have this pressure on myself. And I, I also wanted to take a moment to identify those who have been through bariatric surgery, specifically within the three months post-op, you lose a significant amount of your muscle, significant amount that comes with the name of the game. It's why we have the significant protein that we need. So your energy level is going to be drained. You know, your, your muscle mass is going to start shredding. So don't try to push yourself as much as you need, right? There's, you have a whole life to get where you want. Yeah, it's, you brought that up and it's so funny. I was one of those people that felt like they had all of the energy in the world after surgery, like mentally, I was like, all right, let's go, let's do this. Mm -hmm. And then I would start going for walks and 10 minutes in, I'd be like, God, turn around. Like I'm, I'm depleted. And that was a hard time uh, to be in as you know, Jason mentioned also, like, I thought I was just going to be a gym rat. I thought I was going to love moving my body and I do to an extent. Um, but I, I don't like crave it in the sense, in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody does, right? Like, I'm going to give you a secret. I'm a certified personal trainer who hates exercise, right? (laughs) It's just, because it's not natural to me. Right. Yeah. It's never been natural or how I was raised. Yeah, it's was a constant say, effort. Sorry, April. No, I was just going to say, we talked to so many certified personal trainers and all, all of them say this, right? Does Michaela, Leanne, right? So many movement experts in our community and they go days or long stretches where they just do not feel like, like moving. Mm-hmm. And I think what really has separated them or has allowed them to get to the place where movement is just something they do every day is they just committed to making it a part of their life and they did it no matter what it is it is one of their adjunct therapies and maybe like for us and Jason like I was thinking about this as you were you guys were talking it's like maybe changing the mindset on this this isn't something that I maybe want to do this is an adjunct therapy this is a part of my treatment plan and I will commit to doing this because this is what I have to do. This is, this is the plan. And you were so, I mean, your pre-op, your post-op, like all, whatever your surgeon said, you did it. You stopped drinking soda a year before your surgery because you knew it was, it it was going to be something that you just had to do. I yeah. wonder if you can get to the same place with movement that you did with soda and with all of the other things that you were in compliance with. Yeah, I'm going to have to look at it like kind of what we discussed in one of the other podcasts where I say, you know, it's, it's, it's about signing the contract with yourself and not breaking that contract. It's yeah. about, you know, realizing that there's much more on the line than just the gains that I see when I'm going and working out. It's, it's about my body changing. It's about me you know, I, I had the surgery and did the thing so that I could have this second lease on life so that I could live longer. But if I don't do anything to adjust my, you know, health, just besides just having surgery, like I, it's going to be all for nothing. Well, and you just, you said that and this just popped into my head. It's like, it's a two year contract, right? Like we sign it when we are like, in the process of having surgery and we're doing all this stuff the first year post-op you know we're still under contract then it's like oh that contract expired okay we're free agent baby Woo! you know no we got to renew that shit every year like we need to re-sign that that contract with ourselves every year every day whatever like that just popped into my head and i was like oh, okay no that makes sense 
Oh my God. It makes total sense because think about it. Like, yeah. When you commit to surgery, like, Oh no, like I no, I'm doing this. And you, you really stay committed all the way up to surgery. And then after surgery, you have it, you've got a little bit of like, eh, what did I do? Then you start feeling great. The weight drops and you're like, yes, I'm doing this. And then you get to about that one year mark and like your weight has kind of slowed down. Your body's changed. Like you're kind of like, Oh, everything's normal again. Cool. Like mission accomplished. And that contract expires and you're like, mm, I don't have to sign another contract. Like, good. like I'm just going to pay by month. It's totally fine. No, it is not totally fine because you go back to just doing exactly what you were doing before that contract. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like coming, it's like coming from winning the Super Bowl on your team to you coming back to sign your new contract and half your team is gone. So, you know, you're not going to win. You know, you're going to suck the next season. So you're like, I don't really want to sign this. So I'm just going to go home along here. Well, do like, I think about my beloved Seahawks, right? The year of the, the lifetime, just everything went right. And they were dialed in and they were doing everything they needed to do. And they went to the Super Bowl and they crushed the Bronco. I mean, it was just like, Phew. and I think I remember like, the day like Pete Carroll in his interview or whatever the day they won the Super Bowl or maybe the next day and he was like I'm sorry what what Super Bowl I don't know what you're talking about it was like straight clean yeah. slate no yeah we, we won the Super Bowl yesterday it's a new team now like now we have to rinse and repeat this and I was just <laughs> like I'm sorry what and they got real close to getting to the Super Bowl again but I mean <sighs> Uh, this conversation is so broke me. Like I am like, <laughs> but I just want to caution, right? When we sign a contract, don't make it a rumple silkskin contract, right? Don't put that all or nothing or those shoulds or oughtas or the guilt, right? Yeah. That pressure can bog us down sometimes, especially with something that we already have such feelings towards and may not feel comfortable with. I think because I'm sitting here kind of reflecting on my pre-op and my, you know, first year post-op, it's like I lost a hundred pounds in less than a year, right? Like most of us do. Um, and I'm thinking back to like my mindset and it really wasn't, it didn't feel bogged down. Like I wasn't miserable. I wasn't uh, was it hard? Yeah, absolutely. And I cried quite a bit, but I wasn't miserable. I wasn't like, I wasn't doing the shoulds and I wasn't having guilt. It had that, I had that pull mm -hmm. from within me to say, no, like I just have to make this happen because at that point it was life or death. It's still life or, or death. Like I, I'm still in the same journey, but I just lost that pull. Mm -hmm. yeah because i mean because honestly my thought process on it is is that it's the, the contract with myself isn't going to be that if i don't go to the gym five days a week i suck and i failed it's mm -hmm. legitimately there's no reason i can't have my ass in the gym three days a week there's just no reason my other my, my only other reason is, is it feels better to sit my ass here at home and play around on my phone than it does to go to the gym but so that's it's not right yeah, it's, it, it, it's not a real yeah it's not a real reason <laughs> as to why I can't go. It's mm -hmm. the fact that I just need to like, I need to get back to the routine where I have my shoes on at lunchtime. So when it's time to clock out, I get up and walk right to the truck and go. There's just no, there's just no reason for me not to do it. So that's more or, le more or less the contract I'm, I plan on signing with myself is the fact that there's just no reason I can't do it. Mm -hmm. call on me. This bit. I tell you, okay, this book, I, I'm, I'm going to quote from Katie Milkman. The book is How to Change. I read it this summer. What we are talking about is so powerful and it is, it is so spot on, right? Because Tamisha, exactly what you said is what Dr. Milkman says in her book. Procrastination is one of the reasons that we don't change. Procrastination is one of the things, and you, you just said it. I can sit here and watch TV and procrastinate and not do it because going to the gym is just as easy to do as it is to not do, right? So if we've got this choice, this fine line, we can go, eh, and we can procrastinate. Well, her research has shown that a commitment device is something that we can use to actually make these, these changes that we want to do. And what she, one of the things she recommends is making a contract with mm -hmm. ourselves, right? And kind of making it public. And I'm just gonna quote straight from the book. This is on page 77. 
She says, the psychology of researchers were counting on it to buoy this tactic to, to work, that as soon as you sign a commitment and post it on your wall, you've created a mental cost for writing an unnecessary prescription. If you're tempted to write that script, now you're going to like, you don't want to go back on that word. So making these public commitments, right, to yourself or to others is a way that we can fight back against procrastination. It's a way that we can make the change last. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what, what we're talking about. Yeah, hard commitments, soft commitments. I mean, I could go on and read this entire book. Oh, cognitive dissonance. I mean. Mm -hmm. It makes it real, right? It's not just figurative anymore. It makes it real. Yes. But like Jason was saying, not having that time frame or limiting that time frame to something that's accessible, something that is not going to set you up for failure. I have to go to the gym three times a day. I have to go to the gym every week, right? Or every day of the week. It's not sustainable. You're setting yourself up for failure. You're setting yourself up for those cognitive distortions. That's that rumple still skin contract. Yes. And, and, you know, there are always going to be extenuating circumstances. If something happens, you're out of time. If something, you know, there's always, there, there's always things that can come up that does not mean it voids the entire contract. Mm -hmm. It just means that you have to get back to doing it as soon as you can. You yeah. have to, it's more often than not is what we're looking for. Or be creative, right? Just because your, your, um, schedule may have changed doesn't mean that you can't take a creative approach to movement like we said movement can be anything and it's that's actually what they this book this book is my go-to book man and they um you know dr levenstein does a lot of figuring out what we're feeling internally but putting it into something tangible for us to see so they take our binge eating disorder and they call it, you know, an animal and the animal, you need to cage the animal and it physically takes that, that image of our binge eating and our wants and our, you know, food impulses and like physically has you see it as an animal. And that's what we're doing with mind, uh, with movement, right? We are physically putting it on a document for us to hold accountable. It's no longer in our head. It's something tangible for us to keep sight of. It's now real. Oh my God. Holy bananas. And what book is that, Tamisha? It's called Never Binge Again by Glenn Levingstein. It is a fantastic book. I will warn whomever would like to read it that he does utilize the image of a pig to help us understand our food impulses. So if that affects you in a way and he does give warnings, you know, if this is going to irritate anything or bring up anything, please stop reading now. Mm, it's a good. very in your face book but it's something that I personally needed to help me see that tangible feeling. And do you think, would the, would the book be helpful for people who have not been diagnosed with binge eating, eating disorder, right? Is this just a book that is accessible for anybody if you're struggling to kind of make changes in your life that you would, that you'd like to see? Absolutely. I, um, you know, I, I say proceed with caution because the language can be very in your face. If you need that drill sergeant to help you, this is the book for you. Um, and it, you know, it tells you about why we have those impulses and why we go to the kitchen and black out and don't even realize that we're consuming cookies as we're looking at the fridge, figuring out what we want for dinner. Like we don't, and so many times I've done that and, you know, didn't even realize that I had cookies, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it tells us that that's part of our lizard brain, right? Or I'm either going to eat it, I'm going to fight it, or I'm going to mate it, right? And that's a natural cause. That's our first instinct. And that's what's responsible for us grazing, Oh, crazy. Okay. I've heard this before. Like other people in our community, I know have read this book because I've heard lizard brain, like that's very mm -hmm. distinct. That's a distinct statement that I have heard multiple times. Well, and it's just, it's fascinating to me that, right. A conversation about movement is so related to our mindset. It's so related to, to our actions, to our thoughts, to our behaviors, 
right? Something that we think is actually very separate, right? And its own kind of box, if you will, right? Is actually, it's not, it, it's all in this basket of our life and it's all intertwined. And when we start to kind of think or tackle or make changes in this one area, it kind of forces these changes or these acknowledgements in these other areas. But that's kind of like the bariatric journey, right? Like what we thought was just weight is not actually just weight. It's so much more. It is so expansive. It, it, it's, just, it's so hard to wrap your, it's so hard to wrap your brain around. Cause when you tell people like, well, all you do is eat less. Mm, not even close, not even close. That's like 5%, I think of, of really what this journey is. And when you're trying to describe to people what the work of weight loss surgery is, how do you, how do you, how do you summarize this conversation or everything that we do in like an elevator speech? You can't, you can't. No. And that's why when people are like, oh, it's the easy way out. Mm. We have a very different definition of easy because it is, it just, it is not. <laughs> Well, off from that, I want to normalize it for somebody who is listening, right? We all have something. We all have that dopamine high. No one bats an eye at the person who is going to the gym multiple times a day because it's culturally appropriate. Society claps at the person who's taking their health under control, right? But why is there's a stigma on us having that dopamine high with food? Everybody has something. We just need to figure out what a healthy alternative is, right? So I just want to normalize that, that everybody has something and you are not wrong for the thing that you have. We just need to make sure that it is not affecting your life in a negative way. Yeah. I mean, we all have, we all have that need, right? For, Mm -hmm. for the good feelings. We all do. It's just how we get it. And how does that affect our physical health, our mental health, all of that? Oh my God. I, (laughs) there's so much here. There's so much here, but really when I, I I guess my, my big takeaway from this conversation is that movement doesn't have to fit in, in one particular box, right? Movement is anything that that, that brings us joy, anything that we connect with. It can happen when, when and where. Movement, we can get to a place where we think more positively about movement, but kind of using that triangle, right? Understanding the cognitive distortions that we have around it, changing our thoughts or behaviors or actions to be more positive when it comes to movement, thinking about movement as an adjunct therapy to our, to our bariatric lives, starting small, right? Reconnecting with what it means to us and just accepting that it probably should be something that is just a part of our everyday lives in a very small way or in a larger way, but somehow a part of our everyday life. Mm -hmm. Tamisha, is there something else that you really want people listening or watching to know about movement and their bariatric journey? It all starts with one step. And I know that sounds corny, but it just takes one mindset. It just takes one day and just one extra effort every day. And then it becomes less overwhelming. Wow. We got you. You were amazing. If people, (laughs) yes, you got you. Yes, that is the first time that somebody has said it. And it's the most truthful statement of the world. You're amazing. I know. I said back at you. Oh, I thought you said I know. I mean, true. Just kidding. Okay, good. thank you. Good, good. Mm-hmm. Back at you, my friend. I was like, what? No one said you're a badass? <laughs> what? What is the community? Oh, God. I'm oh. telling you. Matt and Jason, before we go, I would love to give you also the space to say like, what are your big takeaways from this conversation? Because there was a lot here. I feel like we all kind of had moments where we were like, uh, I think you just broke me. Yeah, I think mine is just move your body in however feels good to you and don't overthink it. Yeah, mine's just go easy on yourself. If, you know, you can sign the contract, you can show up for yourself, but you also have to give yourself the space to 
have things come up or reasons or rest days or whatever that may be um, that, you know, it's more, like I said before, it's more, it, it's about, you know, more often than not, as long as you're going the majority of the time, then that's all you need. I mean, it's, it's more than you were doing before. And it's, you know, that it, it's very important to your journey, regardless of what stage you're in, it's only going to help make you healthy. And I swear the the further along I get in my own bariatric journey, the more and more I understand Nike's slogan, just do it, just do it, just do it in any capacity. If, if I acknowledge that movement is a part of my adjunct therapy to my primary treatment, right, which was bariatric surgery, then this is just something I need to do. Like I take my vitamins, like I drink my water, like I start with protein. This is just an adjunct therapy that I'm going to need to battle, fight back, deal with, live with my chronic disease of obesity. And I think I've just been fighting it for so long because I too just have an aversion to the word exercise, but I sure do love to move my body. So I need to focus on moving it in ways that, that, that it calls for in ways that it feels good. And I just need to do it. I need to make it my first priority, not my last priority, right? We all are great at shoving what we need to the side because we're all give givers and people pleasers and all that kind of stuff but if we keep doing that we're going to end up looking and feeling like what we did before surgery because that's what we did before surgery we put our needs last mm -hmm. and if we go back to living as we lived before surgery after surgery we're going to look and feel as we did before surgery after surgery and nobody wants that if we want to live differently we have to live differently and this mindset shift about movement, incorporating movement into our lives daily is part of that treatment plan. It is that, it is that adjunct therapy. It's showing up for yourself. It is showing up for ourselves. And we, and we already showed up in such a huge way. We committed to having surgery. We have committed or we have had it. That's mm -hmm. a huge way that we showed up for ourselves. Mm -hmm. It can be frustrating to get to the other side of surgery and realize, oh wait, I have to continue to show up for myself. I can't just show up the one time and it like counts for the rest of my life. I have to continually do this day in and, and day out. And that takes a lot of work because we didn't show up for ourselves before surgery. Again, we want to live differently. We have to live differently. And I think I speak for all of us as we're all patients. We know how exhausting that is. Mm -hmm. We are living that exhaustion with you. And some days it is real hard to show up just one time. And as patients, we have to show up multiple times every yeah. single day, right? And we get that, but this is what we have to, this is the work of weight loss surgery, friends. This is it right here. Oh my goodness. Miss Tamisha, if people don't know where to follow you online, where can they do so? Sorry, I'm actually getting my multivitamin. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, oh, it's time. Um, my Instagram is time for a change brew and why, and that is my personal journey. Um, you know, like I said, I am a professional in the field, but there's no reason why those two can't overlap. There's a beauty and a, a grace and a space where professionals can also have a journey. Absolutely. And you are also an expert in Berry Nation. So if you would like some more one-on-one -on -one time with Tamisha, like some group time with Tamisha, join our membership community. She teaches general bariatric classes. We're hoping we can uh, talk her into teaching some movement classes as well as some like beginner bariatric support as well. So mm -hmm. we absolutely love and appreciate all that you do for our community. Thank you so much for your time. We know how extremely busy you are and every moment we can get with you is a true gift. So thank you, friend. Back at you. Back at you. Not I know. <laughs> I got that one. I got that one. Jason, thank my friend, you want to take us out? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Tamisha, thank you again. Your your expertise, your knowledge, your time. We appreciate all of that. Uh, to the community, we appreciate you guys for continuing to like, share, subscribe, and tell people about this amazing community because without you guys, you know, we're, we're going to have a rough time. There's not going to be anybody to, uh, for, to, to commute. To, to community with. So we just appreciate that. And uh, don't forget, you can still leave us ratings and reviews on your favorite podcast players, as well as our YouTube channels. If you listen to us on the Anchor app, you can leave us voice messages that we can incorporate into future episodes, which is just another way for us to highlight you guys, which we love doing. 
And uh, just remember, at the end of the day, you've got this, we've got you, and we'll see you next time. Awesome. Bye, friends. Bye, everybody.